Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody's awake, I hope, not freezing. My name's Elise Cato, and I'm the Director of Community Programs at the World Affairs Council. Chinese firms, many that are state-owned, are going global, in case you haven't figured that out by now. They're purchasing commodities, investing resources, and accessing foreign markets. China has become one of the top investors in Africa, South America, and Eastern Europe, the top foreign holder of U.S. debt, and is speculated to be buying up a record, amount, record quantities of gold. With a limited amount of resources on the line, what does China's race for resources mean for the rest of the world? For 60 years, the World Affairs Council has worked to inspire global understanding and engagement in Greater Seattle through programs with teachers and students, through bringing delegates to meet with local community members and organizations, and through public programs like this one tonight. Our programs are made possible through sponsorships and community partnerships, and we would like to thank tonight's sponsor, Microsoft, for their support. We would also like to thank our co-presenters for their promotional support, and they include the Greater Seattle Chinese Chamber of Commerce, the University of Washington's African Studies Program and the Evans School of Public Affairs, and Seattle University's Asian Studies and Global African Studies Programs. As we do with all of our events, in order to reach a larger audience than the one that's here tonight, we're going to be tweeting this event from WAC Seattle. The hashtag will be MoyoWAC, M-O-Y-O-W-A-C. So if you're on Twitter, follow, join, ask questions, engage. We believe that dialogue and discussion are critical to developing a better understanding of the world, and I invite you to participate in the conversation. We will be doing open Q&A for tonight's event, and we have volunteers who will be passing around a wireless microphone. We do also have note cards available if you'd prefer to write down your question and pass it to a volunteer to ask for you. Moderating tonight's Q&A will be Dr. Anad Young, Professor of International Studies and History at the University of Washington. Between 2002 and 2010, he was the director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. Prior to joining the University of Washington, he taught at Sweetbriar College and at the University of Utah, where he was chair of the history department and subsequently director of its Asian Studies program. Dr. Young was born in India of Chinese parents, grew up and attended school in New Delhi, and then finished high school in Mexico City before moving to the United States to attend college. So truly an international citizen joining us tonight. With that, a quick introduction of our speaker. Dambi Samoyo is an international economist who focuses on the macroeconomy and global affairs. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Dead Aid, Why Aid is Not Working, and How There is a Better Way for Africa. She also just let me know that her new book, it just hit the bestseller list today, yesterday, yesterday, I believe. In 2009, Ms. Moyo was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She is regularly published in the Financial Times, The Economist Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. She completed a PhD in economics at Oxford University and holds a master's degree from Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Dembi Samoyo to the stage. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm not too sure I like the idea of moyo whack. I think that sounds a bit, <laughs> maybe that the fact that they've dropped the is whack, maybe I should feel a bit better. But uh, in any case, it's a pleasure to be back in Seattle, although I have to say this is the first time of many, many visits here that it is absolutely freezing cold. Um, so I'm a bit disappointed about that. But um, thank you to Microsoft and to the hosts. Uh, World Affairs Council, um, really appreciate the opportunity to be back here and the opportunity to be able to speak to you about what I think is the most important uh, issue that we will be facing uh, in the decade to come, um, which is commodity scarcity. Um, 
I originally had not planned to um, use slides because I think that it can be it can sort of belabor the issue. But actually, if in in retrospect and thinking about it some more, um, I have some slides that I think are pretty fantastic and illustrate a lot of what the story is. So I hope you'll indulge me, and I also hope that you will be um, engaged enough um, and interested enough to push back and ask questions um, during the Q and A. In terms of uh, what I'd like to do this evening, uh, I would like to basically break the discussion into three parts. Um, first of all, I'm going to spend a bit of time giving you a global snapshot of where demand and supply um, of the resources, uh, land, uh, such as arable land in particular, um, water, energy and minerals are, um, so that we can, when we discuss what China is doing, it is set in the context of where global um, demand and supply pressures are. And then secondly, I would then focus specifically on what China's uh, specific demand and supply uh, pressures are. Um, and again, I think that will be a good lead-in um, to sort of going from the aggregate or the macro world picture to um, drilling down into more specific China, China picture. Me? Take that over just a little bit more. Ah, OK. There we go. Is that better? OK. Um, and then finally, I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about some um, ongoing issues. Um, I guess I've, I've classified this into two areas. I will spend time uh, specifically detailing China's three-pronged approach to securing resources around the world. Um, and then I will spend um, a little bit of time talking about some of the more controversial issues, um, things like uh, the charges of uh, neocolonialism, labor and environmental um, uh, issues that China is often accused of, uh, use of prisoners, and so on, um, to sort of motivate the discussion of uh, where I think uh, there might be a lot of misinformation. But in any case, I hope you enjoy the evening, and I hope that we'll have an opportunity to, to speak some more about uh, what's going on around the world. So I'm going to start off on the demand side, the global demand picture. There are three key uh, aspects, so key three factors that are driving global demand. The first one, as you can see from this slide here, is the global population. Uh, the world population, roughly about 7 billion today, is expected to skyrocket to 9 billion people on the planet by 2050. Um, you can also see from the pictures um, that I have in front of you that a lot of that demand pressure will be coming from the emerging markets. Uh, today, almost 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging world, and that trend um, will continue um, with only roughly 12% of the world's population living in developed economies. I want to state very clearly and upfront that this population growth is an actually an aberration. It's something that has not been seen uh, in historical context. And actually, many sociologists and demographers believe that it will not be seen again after we plateau out at around uh, 10 billion people on the planet by 2100. Um, I really like this quote. And if you'd indulge me, I'm going to read it. It's by a sociologist. I don't know whether he'd call himself a sociologist. But anyway, John Durand, I think, is a sociologist with some demographic leanings. Um, but his statement was as follows. The extraordinary proliferation of the human species cannot fail to be recognized as one of the principal features of modern world history. In historical perspective, it appears as a unique episode in the growth of the species since its origin. It has no parallel in previous history or prehistory for the speed and magnitude of expansion of numbers. And it seems highly unlikely that a comparable expansion will occur again in the future, after the present trend has run its course. Um, I state this, uh, or reiterating, this is from 1966, because it, this, what we are dealing with now is a very unique set of circumstances. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, the population of the world was 3 billion. Um, we're now at 7. And as I mentioned, we'll be going to 9 and possibly 10 by 2100. So very, very unique circumstances. And this is why it's so important to understand what this means for the world. The second key aspect or key factor driving demand is global wealth. So not only are we getting larger in terms of population, but a lot more people are becoming wealthier. The estimates are that we will have an additional 3 billion new people in the world middle class by 2030, which is just around the corner. So it really, really is, is important to look at 
how those people who, do, who would like to live like us in this room, in the sense that they would like to live like, uh, to achieve Western standards of living, how those demand pressures will, uh, will, will be felt um, on the uh, global resource supply. Um, as you can see from the slide presented here, a lot of that demand pressure um, from wealth will be largely felt from the growing middle classes in places like Asia and Africa, but you can